Are you suffering from the pain of losing a loved one? Today, my guest will share how God comforts him through the loss of his wife of 45 years. Before I introduce him, take a look at this video celebrating the life of his wife, Rochelle Neiman. Normally, stories don't begin this way. Death isn't something most people want mentioned when we talk about grace, love, and value of life. However, Rochelle Neiman's story goes beyond her memorial stone. We met in college on a blind date. We went out on Thanksgiving weekend. I never went out with anybody else ever. That was it, 18 years old. We were together every day for 45 years. Rochelle died from ovarian cancer. Time doesn't heal the pain of losing a loved one. Through Christ, feelings of loss can be replaced by joy-filled memories of life. I believe that cancer is defeated. When my mom was sick, she was fighting the disease that ultimately took her life. She would come in and do healing services in the church. And one night I remember she was so sick and so weak, I begged her to just let me or Shannon do the service and for her to rest. And she said, no, we're going to go in and we're going to pray for the sick. And I believe that people are going to be healed. When she passed away, when I saw people's reaction, it became so real to me what her life had meant and it's been in this time that I've come to understand how incredible it is when you recognize that you can live your life in a way that really makes a difference that really impacts people since she's passed away I've learned of all these uh, school tuitions uh, we paid for these rents we paid for these car payments we made uh, prescriptions we paid for, uh, glasses for kids that we bought. For weeks and weeks we just heard stories after story after story of how she just touched so many people. Just over and over again of how my mom intervened in people's lives to help them get through things and it, at the end of the day the story was that she gave grace. Rochelle passed away on December 30th, 2012 just two days after her granddaughter Emery was born. Bittersweet, to say the least. Her grandchildren won't remember Rochelle holding them, but they will always feel the embrace of their grandmother's legacy of love. I will always tell Emery how my mom showed that you could live such an incredible life of quality, um, centered on the Word of God, focused on the Word of God, a life that was still so fun and so meaningful and that really served an incredible purpose. She had experienced God's grace in her life and therefore she knew that whatever she had experienced from God to give that same experience to the people that she was around and she did it day in and day out. It was really incredible to watch. You know, she loved people and she loved life. The girl squeezed every drop of life out of every day. I used to kid her and say, you know, I think when, when you go to bed at night, the day you just live waves a white flag of surrender <laughs> because you just pound that day. And she just looked at me and said, well, of course. She said, I, I believe God expects that of us, that every day is a gift from God, and you should live it. And the girl lived it. Death. It isn't something most people want mentioned when we talk about grace, love, and value of life. However, Rochelle's story goes far beyond her memorial stone, to the school she started, the church she helped build, the family she loved and the individual she continues to inspire. A Christ-centered life means death isn't the end. It's part of the process of life. The Neemans don't ignore the pain of their loss, but they choose to celebrate and honor the way she lived. Well, Charles, thank you so much for being willing to be with us and share this very personal story in the the pain and the victory of what's going on in your life. Well, it's an honor, and I'm uh, very, very, very blessed to be here and to be able to share this. I hope it helps some people. 
You know, I always admire people of faith who, uh, when they do have a difficulty, whether it's something as tragic as yours or the everyday trials of life, decide that they're going to not blame God, have a good attitude, and move on. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about your story and what you've been feeling. And we want to help the people watching today because I know a lot of them are probably going through the same thing. Well, I would say that, that my story is kind of in two parts. You know, there was the, the part where we were uh, battling the cancer and Rochelle was really battling the cancer. Yeah. Uh, and then the second part was, that, you know, when, when she finally did pass away on December the 30th. And so... Um, it was a it was about an eight month battle for us. Uh, what was that like for you getting all those treatments? Uh, it, it was just you know I- incredibly difficult, as many people know. You know, uh, it's you know of course what I went through was nothing compared right. to what she was yeah. going through. Um, it was very hard. You know, it was very difficult, very very emotionally draining, spiritually draining on me, my kids, my yeah. friends, my church. It was hard on all of us, and, uh, and obviously hard on Rochelle. It, everything kind of came to kind of a, a pivotal point in my life. On uh, December the 23rd, we were in MD Anderson in Houston, and, and um, things were very difficult. Rochelle was not doing well, and it was very hard, and, and we had a, a hotel room uh, next to the hospital, and, mm-hmm. and I was walking. I left her room to go take a shower for a minute, and... Uh, and I'd already settled in my mind that we were going to spend Christmas by ourselves there because and, and mm-hmm. our family was all back in El Paso. My daughter was a week away from having her baby. She couldn't right. travel anymore. Yeah. And my son was doing all of our Christmas services, and so I, I had to be there with her. And I was walking back, and there was a sky bridge there, and I sat down on that sky bridge, and I, I, I felt for the first time, Joyce, in the whole eight-month process, I felt overwhelmed. I wow. just was kind of come to the end of myself. And... I was sitting on that sky bridge, and I began to pray, and I, I really believe that, that I began to make, inter- the Holy Spirit began to make intercession through me. Yeah. And I prayed just some very simple but powerful things, and I and what looking back on it now, I realized that it really kind of set me down a good path, and the first thing I prayed was, I said, I said, you know, Father, whatever happens here, I said, and I'm hoping you let her stay with me. Right. I said, but whatever happens here, uh, I'm never going to ask you why. I'm That's never going to question why. I'm never going to ask you why. And I never thought of that. It just kind of came out and I heard mm. it. And then I said, I'm unexpecting that I would say this. I said, because what happens here is not about me and you. It's about you and her. Mm-hmm. I said, and whatever happens is between you and her. We do try to get into things very frequently that really, to be honest, really just are not any of our business because there are personal things between an individual yep. and God. And certainly, she probably drew very, very extremely close to God. She did. During that time of discomfort that she was going through. She did. And uh, I try to share with people all the time just the uselessness of having to know why about something that you're just not going to understand. There are things in God that we just don't understand. There are mysteries in God that we don't understand. Mm-hmm. And a large part of our trusting God and our believing in God and our relationship with God is not just for when we get things the way we want them, but when things happen that we don't understand. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I, I think that uh, that there's a scripture in Psalms, I don't remember exactly where it was, you know, where David said, I don't concern myself with things more wa- too wonderful yes, for me. Yes, I'm familiar with that. And, and I quit concerning myself with that. It's not, it's not literally, the second thing I prayed was, this is none of my business. This right. is about you and her. Yeah. I did say to the Lord that day on the cross bridge, I said, I just want you to know, in case you don't know, that if she passes away, you're going to have to explain this to her <laughs> because <laughs> she's not going to come in there willingly. Yeah, I heard you say that on a teaching tape I was listening to that St. Peter probably had to pull her in because she really Somebody wasn't to wanting to go. come out and explain this to her at the yeah. gate, you know. So uh, and the second thing I, I said that night was, um, you know, she's always been your daughter. Mm-hmm. And you loaned her to me as my wife, but she'll, she's always been your daughter and she'll always be your daughter. 
And yeah, just for comfort a lot of for people, something that's coming up in my heart is I, I'm sure that there are people watching right now that thought, well, if I would have known that my loved one was saved, I could be more comforted. And uh, But I just kind of feel led to tell you that, you know, you don't really know what happens to a person in the last few seconds of their life. And even that, you have to leave that between them and God and don't torment yourself over something that you're never going to to know or understand. And I just want to reiterate here that I think this, I know I talked to you just, I don't know if it was the day after she died or two days the after. The day after. The day after you mm -hmm. called me. And, and um, I remember how just profoundly spiritually impressed, if that's an okay word to use, that I was when you told me that, that you had told God, I'll never ask you why. Because that is probably the number one thing that people do. They demand having an answer to something that really they're not going to have an answer for. I mean, even if you figure something out that you think suits you, it's not going to be a good answer. And how wonderful it is to be able to say, God, even in this tragic thing that is so painful to me, I trust you. I, I, looking back on it, Joyce, I think that was probably what set me down the path to where I am today, that I... I just, and, and I would love to take credit for it, but I, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit in right. me. And, and I really believe that in, in making that decision, that it, it then opened me up to the future. I do too. Because I really if I too. had stayed there, I would still be locked back. Because I am convinced that I would still be asking God why, and he wouldn't be saying a word to me. Right. It's none of my business. Yeah. It's none of my business. And it's not, it's, what happened there was not about me and him. It was about her and him. It is very hard to understand why someone like Rochelle, beautiful woman, being used by God, helping so many people, just really in the prime of life, would die. And then you have people that are, seemingly as mean as a snake, yep. you know, that just live on and on and on and on. But one of the things we have to keep in mind is that God is a lot more concerned about eternity than we are sometimes. Mm -hmm. And Rochelle's future for eternity was settled. And a lot of these people who don't know Christ, theirs is not. And we need to thank God that he is more long-suffering with them and continues to give them an opportunity. You know, we're going to return and continue talking with Pastor Neiman, we've got some, some other very uh, beautiful, I think, comforting things to share with you. So be sure you stay with us. Well, certainly losing someone that you love can feel overwhelming. But God is our comforter, and he will help us through the pain of our losses. With me is Pastor Charles Neiman. Well, Pastor, we got a, a good start in the first few minutes of the program talking about how uh, even though you had a terrible loss in your life of your wife of 45 years to that disease we all hate, cancer, mm -hmm. uh, that you made a very important decision early on, actually, before she passed away, that you would never ask why. Now, why don't you just continue on, because I know there's a lot of people that are really hurting, and uh, uh, that was a very important first step. But what are some other things that you has helped you to recover? I, I would say that, that immediately in the next couple of weeks after she passed away, that um, I, I basically looking back on it now, it didn't come to me like this, but looking back on it now, there's been like four major things that I've done and continue to do that have really just solidified my life, my kids, my church. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I knew when I was driving home that Sunday morning, I was at the first service, when she, our first Sunday morning service when she passed away. She made me go to church she that made day. Made you go to church. I made like that. Me. <laughs> and uh, so I was driving home, and I had a few moments in the car by myself, and I prayed kind of a Texas prayer, and I said, you know, Lord, please don't let me screw this up. <laughs> you know, help well, me. Well, actually, that, that's important. I remember hearing that on your teachings, and I, I kind of want to explain to the people what you meant by that, that as a, as a believer, as a man full of faith, as a man leading other people, and even just as our witness as a Christian, uh, what did you mean by don't let me screw this up? Well, I, I, I knew that I, I, I could not let my kids down. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't let 
Jesus down. I couldn't let the kingdom down. I couldn't let my congregation down. I couldn't let my friends down. You didn't all of a sudden want to act like you didn't believe what no. you've been teaching people all no. your life. No, I, I, I believe in the abundant life as much now as I ever have. Right. And, and that, you know, Jesus came to give me that life and came to give that life to And that he show. loves you. And Absolutely. this didn't happen because you did something wrong. No, or, you know. no. I don't know why it happened. It just yeah, happened. It just happened. That's you know, right. W welcome to life. God knows. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, I just said, you know, I just don't let me. I just, I, I, I've seen people go through this, and I've seen them collapse. And Lose I, their faith, I turn away from God, no. blame God. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You know, we have a legacy, and, 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 and I, I have this relationship with Jesus that, that, I am not going to let anyone steal from me, and Rochelle would be furious with me if I did, <laughs> and I'm not going to do it. That's and good. so uh, the first thing I knew, number one, I knew without the Lord having to say anything to me, I already knew this, that I had to get back in the house of God as soon as possible. Because Isaiah 40, verse 31, the King James text says, they that wait upon the Lord. But in the Hebrew, it says, they that gather together before the Lord shall renew their strength. That's good. I was exhausted mentally, emotionally, spiritually. My kids were worn out. My church was worn out. My friends were worn yeah, out. Right. But me personally, I was exhausted. And yet, as you know, you can't call time out. You can't say, hold it. I'm going to, you know, everything stop, go in suspension mm -hmm. while I recoup. No. Right. In 20 minutes, I was going to be at home with my kids, and they were there, and they were grieving, and my mm -hmm. friends, and I was going to have to tell the church, and here it goes. It all goes in a new direction right. now, yeah. and, and, and I was going to have to step up, Joyce. I had no choice. Yeah. I had to step up. I wasn't going to start looking for someone else. I had to step up. I could not fail. I could not fail. That's good. And I would not. I That's would much not better fail. than just thinking, well, now I have an excuse to just totally no. fall apart. When I was in my car that day, one of the things I prayed was, I, I decided that in that car, I said, I'm not going to go through life with a limp. And I'm just That's not. Good. I'm not. And so, uh, you know, I got home that day and, and uh, started doing the things with my family I needed to do. And, and the next night we were having our New Year's Eve service and... Uh, you know, I had people saying, well, you know, who's going to do the service? And I said, well, I am. Well, I'm going to do the service. And, and that people were like, you're crazy. And I said, no, I have to get in the house of God. I have to go where the gathering, the gathering, the church mm -hmm. is, because there I will get my strength renewed. There I will mount up with wings of eagles. And I did that service. I did the Wednesday night service. I did the memorial service on Friday night. I did all four weekend services, and I haven't missed a service since. And, in fact, I've done all my services at church. And I've taken speaking engagements around America and around the world, not because I'm running from, I'm right. running to. I'm running to where the strength is. And where the God strength is, yeah. is in the house of God. It's among God's people. And then what were some of the other The second thing that, that happened to me was is that I, I, was, I, I went back to John 11 where Jesus raised Lazarus. And that incredible statement there where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm like you. I'm a teacher. I'm always looking up words and studying words. And mm -hmm. I, I looked up that word resurrection, and it, it, Jesus said, I am the stand-up and the recovery. Mm -hmm. I am the stand-up. And, and, and I realized for the first time in my life that when you get knocked down, and I hear people say, Pastor, and, and they mean it. They say, Pastor, I just can't get up. Mm -hmm. And I know that feeling. I know that feeling. And you can't by yourself. I can't. And then I, I realized for the first time in my life, I don't have to get up. He's in me. And if I will let him, right. he will get up. And when he gets up, I'll get up with him. He'll mm -hmm. pull me up with him. And so I was in my bedroom one night crying and feeling bad and hurting and I started meditating on that verse, and, and I just, I got up out of my bed, and I saw, I purposefully imagined inside of me, it wasn't like a vision, I did it myself, and I saw Jesus stand up, and when he stood up, I stood up. That's good. And that he is my recovery. And then the, he said, I am the resurrection and the life, and the word life means I am the life that satisfies, dwelling mm -hmm. in that life. And I had to say this, Joyce, and, and it was a very powerful statement, and and I really pray people hear me when I say it because what I said then was, I said on Sunday morning, December the 30th, Rochelle left me, but he did not. Right. And, and I cannot say, and we cannot say, and I know why people say it, I really right. do, but I could not say, I can't, I can't live without her. She did not give me life. Right. He gives me life. And 
she left, but he did not. And so I had to take that that burden off of her right. that she was the one that I live for and I had to put it on him because he's the one that gives, he's the life that satisfies. And I think people even have to be careful about developing a mindset as the years go by that, well, my kids are my life mm. or my spouse is my life or, you know, my ministry is my life or my business is my life because none of those are our life. They're part of the life that God gives us. Mm -hmm. But he is our life. And I thought that was also a very good point that you made, that we have to realize that it's not people who hold us up and keep us going. They encourage us. They edify us. We love them. We enjoy them. Absolutely. They encourage us. But Jesus is our life. He is that life that satisfies. And, and by, by reminding myself of that in a greater way than I've ever understood it, then I was able to keep going right. forward. And then the next thing was, you know, 2 Corinthians 11, it goes back to what happened to me on the sky bridge, but Paul makes that list of all the things that happened to him, beaten, robbed, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, all that amazing list. And I was looking at it one night and I thought, you know, he never said, why me? Yeah. You know, and, and if there was ever anybody that could have said, hey, why me? Why not Peter? You know, Peter's the one that denied you. Remember right, him? Yeah, yeah. You know, what about Thomas? You know, why, why isn't Thomas getting beaten with rods? Why me? You know, <laughs> I didn't, I've never denied you. Right. And uh, he never said that. He never said, why me? And I thought, you know, I'm not going to say why me. Because it wasn't me. It was Rochelle. That's good. That's it very wasn't good. Me. And then the last thing is, you know, he took me into 1 Samuel 30 with David at Ziklag. And he was having a good, you know, life was good. David was doing good in chapter mm -hmm. 29. It said he was living upright. And, and, you know, I've always known, as, as, as you do, that sometimes really crummy things happen to good people. Right. You know, right. they just crummy things happen to good people. Yeah, they do. Things you can't explain. Can't explain. And that day, the Malachites came in, took their sons, their daughters, their wives, burned their house, took all the <laughs> possessions. Horrible, horrible day. And it says that the, the, the people turned against David. You know, they all wept until they could weep no more. And then the men turned against David, and they were going to stone him. And it says, because the hearts of all the men became bitter. Right. And, you know, Joyce, I, I, knew, I knew from personal life experience the, the danger of bitterness. And, you know, there's two negative human emotions that are spoken of as having a root. One is the love of money. The other one's bitterness. Yeah. And roots, as we know, you know, you plant a tree in the backyard, and the roots come up in the front yard. Yeah. And, and I've seen bitterness start in an area of life where people can justify it. Mm -hmm. They can justify it, totally justify their bitterness. But 10 years, 20 years, that bitterness is spread into every area of their life. You know, the dictionary defines bitterness as intense hostility. Right. And people become hostile. They become angry and Mean. they begin to take it out. And you end up 15, 20 years, nobody's around you anymore. Nobody wants to be there. They still love you. But they don't want to be around you anymore. And I, I think David saw that. I saw that. And I, you know, I've had guys ask me, say, you know, how are you dealing with bitterness? And I said, I don't have anything to be bitter about. That's good. You know, this didn't happen to me. It happened to Rochelle. I wasn't the one that went to the treatments. I wasn't the one that that's good. had the surgery. I wasn't You're the one, the one that was, that's not here anymore. Yeah, no. I'm still here with my grandkids, yeah. with my family, with my friends, with my church. I'm still here. Although I bet she's happier than we are today. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure in the presence of God that she's happier sure than we she's are. she's dancing like crazy. Well, you know, sadly, <laughs> Charles, we're running out of time here, so I want to okay. just make a couple of comments here, too bring comfort to the people that are watching. You know, God is a God of justice. And I love that aspect of God's character, that no matter what unjust thing may have happened to you, mm -hmm. or like you, if you will keep the right attitude and not get bitter, and not say why me, not get into why God, why, God will bring justice in your life. I can promise you it's another way of saying God will make it up to you. You know, I was abused in my childhood, and God has so made it up to me. And I've already heard you say a couple times that some really great things have happened to you. Just God's way of showing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this up to you. I'm, I'm going to help you. Charles, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. We appreciate Thanks for having it. me. Thank and you. thank you for being with us today. We hope the program has helped you. God bless you. 
I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I'm 
wanna be the greatest Everybody on the fake shit I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest I make this every day and I'm impatient Hoping one day I blow up from the basement Statement, the top is so vacant I don't need shit that I think is amazing Waiting for my day when I'm playing Sold out shows for a thousand faces Hey, give me that crown Getting my way in to be put down It ain't your place, all this my town If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now I'm losing it, the noose it fits Some loose shit, a stupid myth You choose to live or choose to dip You choose to fight or lose your grip And lose a gift, oh Feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Like a neighbor, don't need the different flavors of your problems just to savor. I've 